I'm here with Director Joey Ito, Director of the MIT Media Lab, as of the 1st of September. Yes. And um, a Lifetime Achievement Awardee uh, of the Oxford Internet Institute. It's a great pleasure for me, Joey, to uh, ask you a bit about uh, yourself and your achievements uh, over the past couple of decades. So. Um, Help me understand, um, you obviously look Japanese, but you were not brought up in a Japanese environment. Um, so, so I think part of my environment has always been Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Kyoto, and I moved to the United States. I can't remember exactly, I think it's around two or three, and then lived in the U.S. and a little bit of Canada until I was about 13 or 14, mm -hmm. and then came back to, went to Japan and I went to the junior high school and high school there. Then moved to the U.S., dropped out of two great universities, and then started going back and forth. Um, and uh, I've spent, so I, I've, when I'm in Japan, I, I think I can get away with um, p pretending like I'm Japanese. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think I, I have a, a lot of American attributes. Mm -hmm. In 1994, if I am uh, correct, you uh, started a company in Japan that became the umbrella and ultimately morphed into Digital Garage, the umbrella of a number of uh, very, very successful internet companies, the first search engine in Japan, the first ISP in Japan. Um, what prompted you to move into this very novel, very cutting-edge space? So, so I was, I'd always been interested in computers, and I started out with video games and bulletin boards, and it had always been my hobby. And uh, uh, my mother was working a lot in media, and I was also interested in music. So I was a disc jockey. I worked in movies and television and um, motion pictures, and and also with Japan, there's a even maybe Europe is similar, but there's a, a very kind of hierarchical system where I have to do a lot of bowing and a lot of asking, and there's always permission involved. And it looked like it would have to be 45. I'm 45 today. It would be in most situations in Japan, you don't actually have authority to do anything until you're 45. So it looked like a long path ahead of me, and I don't like waiting a long time. So when, um, and I think it was around the early 90s, late 80s, actually late 80s maybe, that when the PPP and slip and some of that stuff started coming, I really I realized immediately that this was going to change everything in media, and. Uh, I started to shift my energy from mainstream media towards the internet. And as I saw the layers of the stack start to become clear, it became very clear to me this whole idea of um, being able to participate without asking permission, and especially from Japan, which is very much a permission society, um, was just so appealing to me. And as a young person who's anxious to get on with stuff, I decided if I just went straight ahead, I could do that. And so yeah, we, could, we were able to build a website. I mean, back then, we, you needed approval to connect anything to the phone line. And so a lot of what we were doing in the early days, like the ISP and the, and the website, you know, we were kind of at the edges where um, some lofty professors would, were writing articles in Japan about how the Internet was illegal and things like that. But, um, but, but the pivot really was, for, for me, an interest in media seeing this disruptive um, capability of the internet and this idea of, of open access and that eventually would all um, come together and I think it, it has in many ways. Um, was it um, just out of curiosity when you started uh, the, these internet companies, uh, you didn't have a lot of capital, you weren't a, a rich kid who started a company, uh, how, how did you finance the so, so. The, one of the great things about the internet is that it, it has dramatically lowered the cost of creation and distribution. So our first machine was a Sun Spark One Plus that we bought on Usenet for uh, fifteen hundred dollars. Um, that was our capital investment for the web. And PSI Net actually was called IAKK initially, and then um, they wanted to set up a point of presence in Japan. So I lent them my bathroom um, in exchange for unlimited access to broadband, which was 128K at the time, and it was a lease line back to America. And so we were the, the first apartment, I think, that was connected with a always-on, um, back then I guess we were using frame relay connection. Um, 
but but you know for, for, for me that that you know just having access to that was, was was very important and so the capital requirement for that wasn't very high and that was also I remember though when I realized I needed capital was uh, we were working very closely with um, everybody at Yahoo back then so they were at Stanford and we were gonna set up Yahoo Japan as a mirror site and and I was just starting to learn business back then so I negotiated and I was trying to get them to give me 50% of Yahoo Japan in exchange for doing it for them and uh, and we were getting you know and I visited um, Stanford had a discussion with them and then um, I, and I knew Masa from SoftBank at the time and and so and so he swoops in and na makes investment and invites me to a meeting where he offered me one percent of Yahoo Japan for doing the technology and back then he didn't have technical people and I said no, I'm not going to do it for one percent you have to pay me cash um, and so I, I built we built well me and several other people in my startup built the first Yahoo Japan beta server um, for, I, th I think it was like $20,000. We should have taken the 1%. <laughs> <laughs> um, then you, uh, through the 90s, you grew uh, this uh, conglomerate of companies uh, and uh, became uh, uh, quite successful. Uh, I remember quite clearly um, when uh, Simoto-san uh, saw you at one of the conferences that I put on, Mm -hmm. uh, he was completely in awe because you had such a, uh, a, a tremendous reputation in Japan at, at that time already. That, did that happen overnight or was that a sort of gradual process? I think it was a gradual process. Um, part of it is that a lot of the people who knew anything in Japan were in big institutions. So when I was studying payment systems, I went and met people at the Bank of Japan and all, all these different places. and. Um, they, they, they knew a lot more than I did, but they couldn't say anything because of their position. So being completely independent, in addition to being completely irreverent, allowed me to speak up and say, this is going to happen, or we should, this, this, we should overthrow the government, we should do whatever. You know, so, so I was allowed to be very outspoken, and, and, um, and that gave me the opportunity. To, and, and the thing is, when you talk about stuff, this is like a blog, people contact you, so you start actually getting the expertise because of the, of the network you had. And so I think, it was, I think it was a combination of being able to say what I felt, also being able to read English, which helped a lot because a lot of the uh, progress was happening in the U.S. And then, um, and then just being kind of um, ignorant and, and, and um, sort of risk tolerant enough to just try things even without worrying about failure, which is the other thing is there's a, there's a sort of um, uh, 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 a fear of failure in Japan. Um, and, and also, I, I, I tend to like to start things more than run them once they're mm -hmm. started. So I kind of went up each layer of the Internet. So I worked very hard on the infrastructure um, and on, on you know, the Internet service provider layer and then worked very hard to sort of promote the web and so set up one of the early web companies. And then when Search came out, we brought InfoSeq to Japan and then I started working on the advertising layer. And then I, when blogs came, I set up a company, Six Apart Japan, to do blogs. So I kind of moved up each layer. And every time you get a layer, you get a little another wave of people getting excited and you know, bringing Twitter to Japan. And so after a while, you see you know, Sansan makes money on each layer. I get to talk about each layer. <laughs> and, and so after a while, you become sort of, and, and again, it's sort of a, a, a uh, self-fulfilling thing because once you start to be the person that's first to say things people start telling you things to try to get you to say things as long as you can filter you get you get the information early so from from this story um, it's uh, which is an extremely remarkable success story of an internet entrepreneur and then a venture capitalist essentially um, it is you know you you could have been incredibly successful uh, just doing that. Um, what what prompted you to also have this alter ego, this other side that is so connected, so fundamentally linked to the values uh, of the internet, especially its openness, for mm -hmm. example? Is does that hark back to your sort of uh, um, difficulty with the hierarchies in society? Yeah. yeah so. So I, I, you know, I worked in companies that did um, the mainstream media. I knew all these guys, you know, 
Um, I, you know, was a uh, an interpreter for the negotiation between NHK, the Japanese broadcaster, and the Motion Picture Association, Jack Valenti. So I know how these guys work, and and I could imagine how they were going to feel about the internet. And even as we built the first ISP and did all these things, there was always those who would rather not have it open. I mean, and I realized very early on that this was going to become a very um, passionate political debate, open versus closed. And so I realized that you can't take it for granted. You know, I, I knew the internet was going to win, but I knew that you needed to fight for it. So whenever I was working on a layer, I always made sure that I was working on whatever I could do to keep, the, keep, keep it safe, keep it open. Um, and, and I was interested in things like security and um, privacy and trying to understand, and this is back also when Lessig had written code, and trying to understand how technology and the architecture could be presented in a way so it wasn't, so you didn't have to throw away security to get freedom or mm -hmm. vice versa. And so, so those were academically interesting for me, and then I realized that um, you needed to participate in these organizations, um, these nonprofits, and these movements um, to 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 get the layers is one thing, and then one of the reasons I was in media in the first place was I believe very strongly in the importance of communication and and having gone back and forth between U.S. and Japan a lot, and having actually suffered a lot because I grew up in Detroit when Detroit was suffering with the auto industry. I, I realized that communication between cultures was also an essential thing, and as I saw the internet providing voice to everybody mm -hmm. um, and with blogs and things like that, I realized that the, not only is the internet an enormous engine for innovation, but that this would change you know, our you know, democracy and free speech fundamentally. So, so it's always been my. I, I, it's hard to say which is I've spent more time in, but mm -hmm. but fundamentally, I, I, I you know my, the work that I do is in order to build the engine, mm -hmm. so that we can do the change that we need to do. And 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 again, I think pivoting right now to the Media Lab, I think is, is to me, I'm also seeing some of the limits of startup ventures as um, for certain types of innovation because, um, um, you know, enlightened self-interest um, isn't the only reason people do things. So. Uh, you, you did a, uh, if I may say so, non-profit startup, Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get involved with the idea of Creative Commons? So. Lessig, who was one of the founders of Creative Commons, um, was in Japan doing a sabbatical for a year. And uh, I was um, fighting very hard against the Japanese um, um, broken democracy and, the, and this in particular uh, around privacy. And so I was consulting to Lessig because, with Lessig because he was a constitutional law professor. And, uh, and he said, well, are you interested in copyright? And I said, yeah, I'm interested in copyright. And he said, well, we're trying to get Creative Commons at the next level. We don't have a business person on the board. And so I got pulled into the board of Creative Commons. And as the Creative Commons started going from a, a, a kind of a, a somewhat academic idea to a worldwide network that you know, needed to work with all these um, uh, technology companies, I got sucked in more and more. And uh, then eventually ended up um, running it for a while. And, uh, but but I think I think it's 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 essential and it's not it's not close to being completed. So I'm still the chair, and uh, we we have a full time CEO now. But um, but it was it was through that interaction with with Larry. Mm -hmm. um, if if you look back at uh, the the years that Creative Commons has been around, what do you think is the the biggest achievement of Creative Commons so far? Um, so I think there are a number of achievements, but I think that fundamentally. At the policy level, so if you listen to the um, hearing of the, I think it's the National Academy that was in Washington, you can hear the Motion Picture Association, MPAA, and the Record Association, RIA, on record saying they believe that artists should have choice, right? And if you think back to when, before Creative Commons started, there were the abolitionists, the pirates. You were either a pirate or you were for copyright. There was nothing in between. And so there was no debate of, that middle ground and I think Creative Commons has shown that you can have a sane middle ground that's actually um, the people who want to be open in for the most part agree with and the people who want to protect copyright can agree with and it's very difficult to, to create a, 
a strong moderate position, as we know from politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Creative Commons has done a very good job of navigating that both at a policy and political level, but also then deploying the technology and the legal infrastructure in a way that's um, international. And this is also, we just, I just got, um, I was a couple days ago at the, at the global meeting in Warsaw of the um, Creative Commons affiliates. And you know, the other thing I think which is key is we are no longer an American institution. So the work that we're, we're doing, CC0 and things like that, I mean, a lot of that's driven out of you know, Europe and out of, now we have things being driven out of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and again, I think to me, you know, all of these great institutions for the standardization of the internet, so, you know, IETF and W3C, these are non-intergovernmental agencies, right? They're, they're ad hoc organizations that are able to um, manage these standards. And I think in a way, um, Creative Commons has also become a, 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 a true standards body by having all these people um, come to consensus around these things. So there's done, done a number of things, but we, but still, the average person on the street doesn't know what Creative Commons is, so we're still not finished. <laughs> That's right, but you've shaped the debate quite uh, significantly. I, I think so. I think we've been quite successful in that. And uh, um, it's not just me, obviously, and I think it's a, it's a whole community of people. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and it, and you know even this last meeting you can just see the community growing so it's it's really when we talk about your um, your interest in the openness uh, and the the public side uh, of the internet you've done Creative Commons and copyright um, you're involved with Global Voices and that's free speech mm -hmm. uh, you're on the board of Epic and that's privacy. Um, but you are an entrepreneurial personality, mm -hmm. so I imagine that um, you already thinking about the next frontier mm -hmm. of of sort of public challenges or public voice challenges. Mm -hmm. what, what 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 do you think the next big so, frontiers are? So I think there are a couple of interesting ones. I think that uh, um, a lot of this is driven by China, but you see this incredibly. Uh, low cost of manufacture. We've talked about this for a while now, this whole kind of customized small lot manufacture, but, but now that um, manufacturing is, has, has gone to the next level, um, prototyping has gone to the next level with laser cutters and 3D printers and fab labs and hacker spaces, and now we have open hardware, right? And the key thing for internet innovation was that the computers and the, the network getting cheaper allowed things to be created and distributed and collaboration to occur at an increasingly lower cost. And that lowered the cost of failure, which increased the innovation by allowing people to do more things with less, right? Hardware, I think the same thing is going to happen. So now you've got hackers, hardware hackers in China, and some of it's illegal, right? Because they're grabbing the schematics from uh, commercial companies and grabbing the chips that they're using and using the same manufacturing lines as these big companies to build their little backyard cell phones and things like that. So that's on the legal side. On the legal side, you, you, you now have CERN with this repository for open hardware. You've got things like Arduino and, and Lilypad and, and Chumbi and all this open hardware, but there's a whole new generation of open hardware. And then the ability to buy these um, prototyping devices for l small um, hacker spaces. And, and so I do think there's going to be an explosion. We already have kind of the maker movement, but then this open hardware, I think, is going to start connecting with the open internet and a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit. So, so to me, that's a, that's a very rich new area that, um, that I'm looking at. Um, it seems to me that uh, underlying this is a, a deep uh, belief in innovation and innovative force, mm -hmm. uh, as well as openness. Are these two very core values for you? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, the, the sort of industrial revolutionification <laughs> if there's such a word, of media and other things, has really made it the producer-consumer model. And also the producer, the consumer, everything is a black box, whether it's a TV show or your toaster, right? And in the old days, you kind of knew how things worked because it was simple enough that one human being could understand it. We're going back to where programming languages are becoming sophisticated enough so you can understand what they do. Hardware is becoming easy enough so that you can break things up. So this hackability is now become, is coming back in a funny way. Even though it, the world is much more complex than the old days, it's, the, the tools have gotten a lot better. And so I think that this idea of you can't modify it, you can't access it, which you needed to do when, when you, the complexity wasn't being managed very well. Now with, this, with a, lot of, a lot of the new tools, whether the programming frameworks or other, other things, um, you can actually 
allow people to interact with the content, you know, with the hardware, with the software. And so I think we're coming to an age where, where this whole idea of the professional um, producer and the amateur consumer, that's breaking down. And we, it's already broken down in, in content, but this is going to happen in many, many, many things. And, and the other project that I'm very immersed in right now is um, called SafeCast. And we're doing um, radiation measurements in Japan and using citizen scientists and volunteers. And we now have 600,000 um, measurements, um, and which is the largest, largest data set now. And it's open, and we just did a drive-through of the um, of the uh, of the of the restricted zone in Fukushima, and we now have data that shows that some of those areas inside are actually lower radiation than outside, and some of the people have been um, moved from lower radiation to higher radiation zones, and 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 that kind of data the government isn't doing. That first of all, they're not collecting it at that granularity, and the data that they're collecting, they're not opening, and the data that's being made open, people aren't. Um, licensing it in an open way so we can't do the analysis. So to me, this one of the big projects I want to work on is taking all of this open data around radiation, mapping other data like um, medical data, securing the privacy, figuring out the trends, and trying to take this catastrophe, which is Japan, and turning it into something that will be able to collect a lot of data that will help us in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and sorry, and, and, it's, and, and it's all about open hardware. The the best Geiger counter device design now, um, created by Bunny Wong, who was the Xbox hacker. It's it's now licensed under open hardware, so anybody can make it. Sorry. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, sort of l looking at the last two decades of your life, um, if you had to do it again, what would you do differently? Oh, nothing. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything that I regret doing, and um, you know, so I, 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 so one of my favorite books is John Silly Brown's book, The Power of Pull, and he he's always talking about serendipity, you know, and I think that uh, um, I've been very lucky, you know, and if I did anything differently, it would would have been different, and I'm very happy, you know, I think I have the best job in the world right now, the best friends in the world. Um, and so uh, there, there really isn't anything I would do differently. Um, but I'm sure if things were different, I would have done different things. So I can't mm -hmm. say for sure. But I, uh, I don't really reflect in that way. Yeah. Um, but, but surely, let, let me push back slightly. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a very successful entrepreneur who uh, is very successful in also starting up things, um, you are not afraid to make mistakes. Right. Uh, because I, I understand mis making mistakes is a very important right. part of the thing. Oh, so you want to know my mistakes? No. Okay. Yeah. One or two. Okay. Uh, there's, there, I have a few. So um, iMode. So you remember that? Uh, so so iMode, I don't know if you know, but very early on, they were doing something that was a lot like PPP over PPP. They were doing a, a, a packet thing over an existing packet thing. And they weren't calling it internet. And they weren't using HTML. They did this crazy thing called CHTML. So I, so I was with Natsuno, who was the guy running the project. I said, this is the stupidest thing ever. This is never going to work. No one's going to use it. So that was kind of stupid. And <laughs> because it was a huge success. I, I know, but uh, um, I had Natsuno-san at the RishliCon once. Yes. And, and that was when it was going down already. Okay. Uh, so that was a post uh, cusp, I guess. Yes. Yes. But, 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 but it has but, its limitations. It has its inbuilt limitations. Were you pointing at them? I yeah, guess. And, and I think, though, that th this is one of the things that I would learn later in my life, which is that the exact technology you use isn't nearly as important as whether users use it. So, in, you know, in, in venture capital now, you know, and Reid Hoffman is my sort of master teacher on this, but 99% of things fail not because the product isn't a good design or the technology. It's because you don't have any users. Mm -hmm. so distribution is key, you know, and I think that what Natsuno was focused on rightly was the user and the, and he thought that using the word internet would scare away people where and so and that was right. And so I think that, you know, being more I mean, to use sort of marketing speak, more customer centric, more user centric. Um, that's that's an essential part of design, and and I hadn't been I'd been thinking as a more from an ISP perspective, and and, and not as a consumer internet guy. I know that you are um, advising and mentoring a lot of uh, budding internet entrepreneurs, particularly in Asia, in Singapore, but also in China. Um, as you mentor them. Do you also imbue in them your 
set of values? I I do. I I mean, I you know I have no um, uh, uh, what do you what do you call it? I have no reservation in telling uh, startups that if they don't use Creative Commons, I'm not going to invest. You know, I've said that in many cases. Um, you know, I and this is one. I mean, around the importance of being open and um, the importance of sharing. I'm very flexible and and very kind of what, you, what would you call it um, almost wishy washy around most things. But there's certain things that I know I'm right, <laughs> and when I know I'm right, I have no reservation of being very pushy about it. And um, and again, this this is, sounds very arrogant, but but I, it's almost a religious thing for me because it's one of those things where you have to kind of pick a side. You know, you're either against open internet or you're 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 for it. And um, and so that that part of me is um, pr- pretty almost religious. And so when I do when I invest in companies, I I only invest in entrepreneurs who are of that sa- similar um, belief system. And typically, if they're from that similar belief system, it's just a matter of explaining how these different layers fit into this whole architecture of open. And and most good internet entrepreneurs they live off of the fact they exist only because of this ability to innovate without asking permission. If it weren't for that, they would be in, in some big research lab, um, you know, wearing a suit, um, working you know, on some um, big government-specified project. <laughs> Joey, as, as, as we come to the end of, uh, of, of this interview, um, if you had a crystal ball um, and you would take a peek into the crystal ball and sort of suggest where the, the internet or the information society is going to be, let's say, five years down the road, two eternities in internet time, mm-hmm. um, what, what would, you, would you see? Um, so th- there's all the obvious stuff, um, but I think that the obvious stuff is, is, is when you really try to think of it, it's really important, which is I, I've been spending a lot of time in the Middle East um, and and plan to explore more of Africa. And I was just in Tunisia. And uh, I think having that whole population online is going to be incredible. And we have a lot of tools now for translation. There's a and and so 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 the the, the population of the internet is still changing. You know. And so so I think this is going to have a tremendous influence. Um, I'm still very optimistic about the Arab Spring and about the ability for the young people in that region to change things. It may take a little bit longer than we expect, but I think there's going to be tremendous change. And I, I still think that the ability for the Im- Internet to impact um, sort of world peace, global transparency, um, I'm, I'm fundamentally an optimist. And I, I really think that this, this period where we have those in power with secrecy and citizens with no privacy, I think that this is going to reverse. And I think that that reversal will be extremely healthy and it will actually help world, world peace. So, so I think that, I don't know if it's five years, I don't know if it's 10 years, I don't know if it's 20 years, but I think the internet will contribute substantially to world peace. And that we'll, we'll, you know, hopefully with um, OII and our friends, um, we'll be pushing that forward to make it happen sooner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that was wonderful.